Good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Batista Lecture Series. My name is Danielle Robinson. I'm the current director of CIRLAC, the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean. The title for this evening's panel is Uprooted, Race, Land, and Dispossession in Latin America and the Caribbean. But before we dive into our exciting program, I have three short announcements and one notification to share. The first is that for the first time, CIRLAC is offering its own course this summer. It is called, it is in Anthropology 6300, Convergences, Disparities, and Fault Lines, Research in Latin America and Caribbean Studies. It's being taught by the illustrious Honor Ford Smith from EUC, uh, Environment, Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. Uh, it is a three credit course being offered in S1, so first summer term. So please join us, whatever faculty department you're in, we would love to have you. So please follow the link in the chat to get more information. Uh, the next thing I wanted to tell you about is we have two events next week on Thursday. We're co-sponsoring the Wendy Mishner Lecture uh, in AMPD, my home faculty. Uh, the title of the presentation is Facing Human Wrongs and Hospicing Modernity, and the talk is being offered by Professor Vanessa Machado Giolivera Andrioetti. Um, she's the research chair in race inequalities and global change at UBC, um, and I'm sure someone will drop in the chat how you can register for that. It's offered at 2.30 on March 31st. And finally, we have on Thursday evening, we have our own panel. It's being sponsored by the CIRLAC Student Caucus. It's on climate change in the Caribbean. The title is The Role of Capital in the Climate Crisis and the Movement of Climate Justice. And it's at 6 p.m. on the 31st. The speakers are Meline Eileen and Dr. Esther Figueroa. Um, so please join us. We have a lot. Uh, it would be a very rich and full discussion at, at these events. Um, I also have uh, something worrisome that I need to share. Uh, one of the speakers this evening is unable to join us, Lottie Cunningham Wren. Lottie is unable to join us because the NGO of which she is a director, uh, Sehud Khan, it was just canceled by the Nicaraguan government. Uh, this is not a minor administrative issue but an act designed to intimidate and harass her and her members. Uh, this is likely just a prelude to seizure of their land and assets and even criminalization of their important and vital activist work. So Lottie and Sehud Khan are not alone in this treatment. Civil society organizations across the region that are working on issues relating to human rights, indigenous rights, Afro-descendant rights are being targeted in similar ways by governments that dislike what they do. And our moderator this evening, Miguel Gonzalez, is going to speak about the situation in Nicaragua later this evening, and will suggest some concrete ways that we can support Lottie and her organization right now. And so at this point, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Miguel. He's a professor in the Department of Social Science in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. He's a member of CIRLAC's Batista Series Committee, and he'll be our moderator this evening. So thank you, Miguel. Thank you very much, Danielle, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for being here. Um, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of the Dr. Tamika Samuels-Jones from the School of Administrative Studies at York University uh, to the organization of this panel. We originally planned to have Tamika to come moderate this panel, but unfortunately she fell ill and she's not going to be able to, to take on this role. So I'm, I'm gonna be the, um, the only moderator of this session. And now let me uh, ask um, Professor Ravi De Costa, Dean of an Associate Dean Research and Graduate Studies at York University to welcome our panelists. Uh, Ravi, please. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, welcome, everyone. On behalf of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us this, uh, this evening for uh, this evening's uh, installment of the Michael Baptista Lecture titled Uprooted, Race, Land and Dispossession in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, the faculty is delighted to support this event. Um, I'd like to first thank the Centre for Research on Latin American and Caribbean uh, Studies for um, 
uh, for hosting this long-standing lecture, which together with the Michael Baptista Essay Prize um, for graduates and undergraduates uh, and the many activities that CERLAC runs each year to recognize and, uh, and celebrate the many researchers, students, faculty and visitors at York who work in Latin American and, and Caribbean studies. Um, thank you, Danielle and Camilla for your leadership and dedication. Uh, in the last few years, the, the lecture has taken on the form of a panel which enables a range of diverse voices uh, to come together in a dialogue. Uh, the isolation and separations we've, uh, we've experienced in the last couple of years have disrupted many of the relationships we have as researchers. Uh, and this is particularly the case for those who work with and for Indigenous, Afro-descendant and other marginalised communities. These communities have borne an un unequal share of the impacts of the pandemic in many ways, while the forces of colonialism and dispossession have continued mostly unchecked and, and often out of sight. Tonight's panel is therefore an important opportunity to focus on those communities' experiences and to revive and strengthen the connections and networks that give so much of our research uh, a purpose. Um, I want to especially recognize and welcome our guest speakers. Uh, Stephen Pertz is a distinguished sociologist based in Texas. Uh, um, his work has been in researching Southwest Amazon uh, for many years. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Yaroslava Avila Montenegro, uh, a Mapuche leader and activist who's also a doctoral researcher in our Department of Politics uh, in the faculty. And of course, Kimberly Palmer, a recent graduate of um, environmental studies uh, doctoral program. Uh, lovely to see you again, Kim, um, who's long uh, studied and researched the experiences of the Garifuna communities. So we're honored to have you all here and look forward very much to your insights. Finally, I want to sincerely thank Tamika Samuel Jones uh, and Miguel Gonzalez for your exceptional work in organizing this, uh, this lecture series and uh, gathering us all here this evening. Um, so with that, uh, please enjoy the evening and many thanks again to everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravi. Um, next is going to be your, our land acknowledgement. And for that, I'm going to ask uh, Sebastian Oriamuno. He's uh, our PhD student in the graduate program in dance studies at York University. Um, Sebastian, thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Hi, everybody. This evening, I'm calling in from Tacoronto or what is commonly known as Toronto. This is where I'm currently living and where York University's campuses and CERLAC are located. Tecoronto is an area that has been the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. It has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. This territory is also covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are the current treaty holders, as well as the Williams Treaties, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. This land is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Today, Tacaranto is home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities, as well as settlers from diverse backgrounds such as myself. As an immigrant from Chile and therefore a guest on this land, I've been fortunate to live here and learn different dance forms, continue in Spanish, my mother tongue, and conduct research that explores the relationship between memory, placemaking, and cueca, the Chilean national dance. I'm grateful and I recognize that I'm privileged to be able to do these things since indigenous practices and knowledge systems around the world have been purposefully banned and or erased and are currently in the process of being reclaimed. In last year's collaborative student conference between the Center for Refugee Studies and CERLAC, Dr. Barry Lavallee emphasized how indigenous people don't have a mother country to return to in order to relearn their languages and practices since this is their mother country. Uh, in a sense, like Canada is their mother country. He expressed with urgency, quote, when we lose things, it's gone forever, it's extinct. That's what we're up against, end of quote. Land dispossession and racism in Canada and across the Americas and the Caribbean have contributed to the genocide of indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples, affecting their languages, practices, and ontologies, which are more often than not connected to land. I look forward to hearing the presentations that will be shared today, 
I'm certain that they'll provoke thoughts on what kinds of partnerships can be fostered between settler, indigenous, and Afro-descendant communities in Canada, the Caribbean, and Latin America to help, su uh, to help support efforts towards reclamation and reparations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for, that, um, for the land acknowledgement. Um, as Danielle commented in her welcome to this evening's event, uh, Lottie Cunningham is not going to be able to speak today. The cancellation of the legal status of Sehutkan in Nicaragua last week, um, along with uh, 24 other nonprofit civil uh, society organizations, is taking place in a national and regional context of an increased criminalization of the work of land and human rights defenders. In Nicaragua, attacks against indigenous leaders and the organizations that document the encroachment of extractive industries, the damaging violence promoted by illegal settlers, and the expansion of cattle ranchers have occurred in a context of a socio-political and human rights crisis that worsened since April 2018. From 2015 to date, 62 indigenous people have been killed due to land conflicts, 56 injured, 49 kidnapped, and four disappeared. Entire communities have been forcibly displaced due to deliberate attacks on their means of subsistence. And these crimes remain in impunity. Sehut Khan has been documenting all these abuses. For her commendable work in ensuring legal protections, including initiating the process of demarcation and titling of indigenous lands, Mrs. Cunningham received the prestigious International Rights Livelihoods Award in 2020 which recognizes the actions of individuals who work for a more just, peaceful, and sustainable world for all. Over the last two years in Nicaragua, um, the, the Nicaraguan government has passed legislation that further restrict the civic and democratic space in the country. And indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples have been especially targeted because they decided not to remain silent in the light of this environment of intimidation. I spoke with Lottie a few days before the National Police occupied the office of Sehut Khan in Bilwi, the capital city of the Northern Caribbean coast. At that time, she said to me that even though harassment was mounting, she had all the intention to speak, to, uh, to speak up today's panel. But she felt that she had no option but to continue her activism and legal work on behalf of the dozens of indigenous Miskito and Mayagna communities her organization have been working uh, since 2005. She's now facing migratory restrictions and the confiscation of Sehut Khan's property. We ask you to show your solidarity and support, Lot, uh, support to Loti and Sehut Khan by writing a letter to the Nicaragua National Assembly and ask to revert its decision in restricting the work of human rights defenders. Uh, you can also send a word of support to Sehut Khan and Loti Cunningham, and we're gonna share in the chat room her contact information. And before I introduce our first panelist, uh, let me just say a few um, uh, rules about today's event. First, um, the question and answer periods, period is going to happen at the end of all presentations. If you get disconnected, uh, use the same link to log in back, please. And also I wanted to mention that we have closed captioning available. You just have to click in the right um, options on your screen on Zoom. Um, and now I'm going to, um, allow me to introduce our first panelist, uh, and that's Dr. Stephen Peirce. Dr. Peirce received his PhD in sociology with a specialization in demography from the University of Texas at Austin in 1997. He has conducted research in the Amazon on migration into frontier regions, socioeconomic drivers of land use and land cover change. Also on socio-spatial socio processes of road building the socio-ecological impact of infrastructure and the political ecology of environmental governance. Um, Professor uh, Peirce is a faculty in the Department of Sociology and Criminology and Law, the Center for Latin American Studies, and the School of Natural Resources and the Environment at the University of Florida. Uh, Professor Peirce, the floor is yours. All right, can you all hear me? Take that as a yes. Let me see if I can manage this. Can y'all see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. 
Um, well, thank you, Miguel, for that introduction. Thanks to Tamika Samuels-Jones for the gracious invitation and to Serlach for organizing this event. And of course, a shout out to Lottie and her NGO. Tonight is really for them since she cannot be here. Um, unfortunately, what goes on in Nicaragua is not unique to that country. And so, fuerza. Um, what I would like to do tonight as quickly as I can uh, is I'm going to serve as something of a figurehead uh, to speak on behalf of the work of many others, uh, notably several of my current and former graduate students. Uh, you can see our title. I'm going to be emphasizing what can be done to address uh, the problems that, that we have raised in this session, uh, framing the issues in terms of infrastructure projects as they may impinge on the rights of indigenous and other traditional peoples, taking a governance approach uh, led by grassroots groups uh, to address uh, unjust uh, infrastructure planning processes. And I'm going to be featuring three of my graduate students, uh, Marlisa Artiaga and Sinomar da Fonseca Jr. and Marta Rosero, a former student of mine, in the cases we're going to talk about tonight uh, from the Amazon. So the problem uh, that we're going to be addressing is that infrastructure projects are fairly routinely planned uh, with limited stakeholder participation. They're often imposed on, on local populations, uh, including traditional peoples. And we see case after case, you know, the economic analyses will overstate the benefits. They tend to neglect the costs. The projects themselves end up costing a lot more than promised initially. Uh, so they look rather less attractive economically than promised. Perhaps more to the point for our purposes tonight is the social environmental concerns are often given lip service and rubber stamped and then overridden uh, in the planning process. And so the, what often happens then, the eventuality is that uh, infrastructure generates various negative impacts, including displacement of traditional peoples or the undermining uh, of their livelihoods uh, in very significant ways. Okay. Um, so many of my graduate students uh, have uh, gotten together and, and gotten into discussions about, well, what does governance of infrastructure mean then? Uh, governance is one of those buzzwords out there that means lots of things to lots of people. Uh, and the definition that, that they came to collectively uh, looking at cases around the Amazon is, is the definition you see on screen. It's, it's a multi-stakeholder process in, in which not just the government and the powers that be in question are, are the ones managing it. It has to be other stakeholders. It has to be a process to arrive at decisions, uh, in this case, about infrastructure. Uh, and you can see the article here uh, that my students have recently published where they went through a variety of frameworks for what we mean when we say governance to arrive at a set of criteria, and they are not few. Um, but they're things that speak to the importance of inclusion uh, of many uh, traditional groups and various other stakeholders. So simple things like access to knowledge, everybody ought to know what's going on. There needs to be coordination among the stakeholders so everyone is on the same page. Uh, there needs to be not only inclusion so everybody who is a stakeholder can be at the table, uh, but there needs to be full participation and not just people sitting passively in the audience. Uh, stakeholders need to contribute uh, their perspectives even up to their ontologies as the, those inform what is important to them and other considerations like recognition of traditional and indigenous rights and then being transparent when it comes to the, the hour of making the decisions. There's more in the article. Uh, I, I can provide the link if people are interested. The point is the list is long, okay? Into the Amazon, uh, those criteria are fairly routinely unmet. Uh, on a project I'm gonna talk about more in a moment, uh, we came to the term the business as usual approach to infrastructure planning that is generally dominated by three major stakeholders, national governments, development banks, and large corporations, okay? Uh, come to call this the iron triangle uh, in, in which the scenario is that infrastructure projects go forward despite known problems, uh, or they have inadequate mitigation programs uh, to reduce their negative impacts. And so the, the question then is, how do you intervene in that process? And, and that's what we're going to focus on uh, tonight. There's a variety of strategies that we have learned from Indigenous peoples and other traditional grassroots groups as they have sought to do so. And the University of Florida has sought to facilitate exchanges and learning uh, about the lessons uh, that have stemmed from those uh, experiences. And so we have sought to advance and facilitate the advancement of st strategies for 
environmental conservation and sustainable development from diverse stakeholders, uh, starting with communities, but also their grassroots organizations, local governments, universities, NGOs of various kinds, and many others. And I'm gonna offer a very simplistic topology of those strategies here. One is that it, it, there's broad recognition of the value of collaboration between local peoples and outside organizations to increase their effective capacity to intervene. Okay, I mean, that, that's sort of the bottom line. Uh, but then the collaboration can inform uh, the array and the effectiveness of what I'll call instrumental strategies uh, to engage those strong stakeholders to intervene in the process to either stop or at least pause infrastructure or to mitigate the impacts if a project goes forward uh, anyway. Okay. So briefly about collaboration. Okay, we're talking about collaboration between indigenous and other traditional peoples of, of various regional, racial, ethnic identities, okay, in which they define the instrumental strategies. They prioritize the strategies that they see as the most valuable, the most effective uh, at intervene and interventions. They are also the ones who establish the priorities for what they want to get out of a collaborative relationship, okay, as opposed to the outsiders like the University of Florida or some other NGO or university coming inside uh, and saying, hey, this is what you should do. So UF and, and our other outside partners see ourselves as facilitators, supporters, cheerleaders, and, and doing other things to uh, empower and support local people. So the, the point of all of that is, is we try to avoid the, the typical power relationships between the collaborators that, that we have come to pay more and more attention to uh, as we have worked together. Okay? So then the instrumental strategies, this is where the plot thickens. Uh, we have drawn on a framework from the Conservation Measures Partnership with the CMP framework, where they have a long list of, of different kinds of strategies out there, highlighting the role of the local stakeholders, the indigenous groups and, and other traditional peoples as they've sought to implement these very strategies. So it allows us to sort of compare notes across cases and allow different groups in very different places, very different cultural backgrounds uh, to come together to talk to each other about what they've learned when they've applied broadly similar kinds of instrumental uh, strategies. So that could be research, it could be capacity building, things that the outside organizations often do, but it can also be communication strategies, legal strategies, direct action, go block the road, policy advocacy, and, and things like that. What we have found in, in listening uh, to grassroots actors is these different kinds of strategies are often pursued in tandem as part of a broader strategic portfolio, and they're very often supported by various forms of collaborative practice. So with that, I'm going to introduce this, this large project that many of us at UF have been involved in, uh, the Governance and Infrastructure in the Amazon, or GIA project, which has operated in the last several years with funds from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation uh, to the Tropical Conservation Program. Uh, in the Center for Latin American Studies at UF. Uh, we do have a website, it's still active. You can see it on screen. I'll reference it various other times because it's got lots of the documents that I'm gonna briefly mention as we go along. Um, I, I wanna highlight the, the roles for graduate students and our postdocs and our dozens and dozens of partner organizations. They are the ones who really did the heavy lifting uh, on this project. GEO worked in four mosaics of protected areas and indigenous lands in various parts of the Western Amazon that are now targeted for strategic infrastructure investments by uh, governments in various countries. And you can see the four down at the very bottom. I'm gonna talk, if I have time, about the first three. Uh, the first is in uh, Western Brazil uh, involving a highway. The second is uh, the Western, Southwestern uh, border between Brazil and Bolivia. Uh, involving what's called the Madeira complex of dams. And the third is in Southwestern Colombia, uh, where there uh, is highly organized indigenous groups and other road projects. Okay. So here's the map. You can see the, the Colombian case at the top right, or top left, sorry, uh, the Southern Amazonas, Northern Hondonias uh, site in uh, Brazil, kind of at the center right and the upper Madeira uh, kind of at the bottom. And you can see in each of these, there's different colored lands, right? Because some are indigenous territories and some are protected areas. They're all these mosaics, as, as I was saying a moment ago. The first of these cases then are, is the southern part of the state of Amazonas and the northern part of the state of Ondonia. Uh, like other cadastral maps around the Amazon, it's this big rainbow of colors where the dark green in this case are the indigenous territories, 
the lighter green are various flavors in which conservation units and sustainable use areas come in. And the Brazilian government wants to continue and conclude paving of a highway that goes through the middle of this. Okay, so it's a very complex space, all right? The middle section of the BR319 highway is the part that's now in question. It has not yet been paved, and that is the priority of the Brazilian government. Paving, however, requires consultation with regional stakeholders, including those various and sundry indigenous groups. The government of Brazil, especially the current administration, has sought to fast track that infrastructure uh, with what amount to some pro forma approvals and a significant lack of adequately participatory consultations. Under President Jair Bolsonaro, uh, he has been openly hostile to indigenous peoples, including on the campaign trail back in 2018. Um, there have been open declarations that the road is going to be paved before the licensing uh, has been completed. And, and there is an ongoing odyssey of legislative initiatives in the Brazilian Congress to effectively promote land grabbing. And there's a long story I don't have time to tell there, okay? So I'm gonna uh, cheer for one of my graduate students, Sino Mar Ferreira da Fonseca Jr., just returned from his field work with indigenous peoples and NGOs out in that part of uh, Brazil. Uh, Sino Mar and, and others at UF and many of our partners in Brazil have highlighted a legal strategy, which I want to highlight here, uh, featuring free prior and informed consent, or FPIC, as a means of confronting these kinds of fast tracking and skullduggery uh, to promote infrastructure. The, the background is that ILO Convention 169, you all are probably familiar with this, on the rights of indigenous tribal peoples, requires FPIC for approval of development projects. This was ratified in Brazil two decades ago, okay? And they have begun to, to, to put this strategy together in this case, in this part of the Amazon. And so conservation NGOs like IEBI have begun collaborating with indigenous organizations and several are listed here to advance FPIC. And, and it has found some traction because elements of the government of Brazil, notably uh, the federal public ministry, have found that there is legal basis uh, to require this and that indigenous peoples and other stakeholders have standing uh, to issue denuncias and engage in other legal processes to confront this fast tracking of infrastructure. So this is what has started to go forward uh, over the last several years. In the process, interestingly, the, the Ministerio Publico has actually consulted uh, the NGOs and indigenous peoples about what exactly the FPIC would involve. And there's talk now of developing indigenous FPIC that begins to incorporate indigenous practices for planning and consultations, okay? Taking insights from indigenous groups, quilombolas, and other traditional peoples in this part of the basin and in others, okay? So there's, a, there's interesting opportunities here to begin to institutionalize and even legally codify indigenous governance practices as they uh, would inform infrastructure planning. And of course, the big goal, certainly in this mosaic, is to support autonomous indigenous governance of their land claims and management of their natural resources. Okay. So with that, I'm gonna to continue to skate onto our second case, uh, the Madera watershed at the frontier between Brazil and Bolivia. Uh, in the 2000s, uh, the Madera complex began to be installed as dams went in on the Brazilian side uh, at sites west of Porto Velho at Girau and San Antonio. Um, there's now planning for more dams uh, farther upriver uh, one at Cachuela Esperanza on the Beni River in Bolivia and the Hiberal or the Binacional right on the frontier uh, between Brazil and Bolivia. Because these dams uh, are in a watershed that spans national boundaries, the negotiations to implement them have been very high level between the national governments who have relied on national media outlets uh, to offer their version of uh, why the dams are important especially as they stand to produce energy for lots of people in cities far away from the sites to be impacted, okay? So this has led to a, a distinct sort of strategy, a communication strategy, as variety of communities along the rivers that stand to be inundated have engaged universities, NGOs, and many other actors to mobilize in resistance by reaching out, by producing actually their own uh, data to contest government claims, 
and to disseminate it in various ways. And here I'm gonna celebrate another graduate student of mine, Marlies Arteaga, and her many collaborators uh, in Bolivia uh, who have been supporting uh, the Upper Madera community of practice and learning. We've tried to create one of these in each of these mosaics. Uh, since 2017, they've pursued a pretty sustained strategic process combining capacity building, uh, for participatory research and then the co-production of knowledge through that research and then dissemination of various products for various audiences. Here's the story in one slide. I don't have time to tell you all of it, but the notion is that they've been very busy. This has been a very participatory process that has highlighted the contributions and the leadership of grassroots organizations who have defined the agenda as well as the procedures for how they're gonna pursue the agenda. So earlier on, as you see to the left, there was strategic planning toward the middle, especially as you get into 2020, there was organization about the research, which was also participatory. The universities participated, but many of the students involved came from the communities uh, that were also represented in the grassroots groups. And as we get into 2021, there's more and more production of documents and dissemination in various means. Okay. So here is one of the, uh, this is actually the, the, one of the last slides in their strategic planning document. Uh, the, the phrase there, no to the dams, yes to life, uh, invokes the sustainability themes that they have highlighted. Uh, the people in the picture feature Lydia Anti, Anti who is the, one of the organizers of a grassroots organization, OCMA, the Organización Comunal de Mujeres Amazonicas, uh, organization of uh, communities of Amazonian women. There's a lot going on in that picture, but it evokes who's in charge, who's leading, and who is speaking, okay? In more recent years, they have begun to produce research results that they have disseminated. You can get this stuff on the GIA uh, site if you like, uh, about uh, various aspects of uh, impacts of the dams on fisheries and livelihoods and communities, uh, and in the document on the right, uh, looking at impacts in particular communities that were returned to those communities uh, and then disseminated uh, beyond there. Okay. I know my time is running down, so I'll continue to skate and, and move toward to conclude here momentarily. Um, but there's also stuff that they have produced on how to do stuff. How would we organize a workshop that is adequately participatory for everybody? And on the right, they have also produced documents on uh, FPIC as well. Okay. With that, I'm gonna to go to the third case and then wrap up. The third is involves uh, our collaboration with indigenous groups in the Colombian Amazon, especially in the department of Caqueta that you can see on the maps there, where there are several in indigenous resguardos. The context in Colombia is that there have been some peace accords, right? That have been signed between at least one of the insurgent groups and the government. That has opened up certain spaces in the Amazonian portion of the basin for extractive interest to come in following roads that were once used by the insurgents or the military. And land grabbing is getting underway, resource appropriation is starting to happen. At the same time, the government of Colombia has recognized it's, it's a moment to begin expanding infrastructure into the Amazon. However, there are also highly organized indigenous peoples who have long-term alliances with outside NGOs. They are well organized there, okay? And they have therefore been successful actually in engaging in some direct action tactics to block roads and, and other kinds of strategies uh, to effectively halt and intervene in infrastructure planning, okay? So what I want to focus on here is, is collaborative relationships, specifically intercultural collaboration. And I want to celebrate one of my former graduate students, Marta Rosero Peña, uh, the Afro-Colombiana who's in the bottom right of this screen, uh, engaging in a Zoom call. Uh, I'm sure lots of us have been doing this in recent years uh, within country partners, including indigenous representatives, okay? And Marta and her collaborators have pursued a research project on intercultural collaboration. So it, it can be done, how does it get done? And we're gonna focus on one of the three cases really briefly, I know I'm running out of time, uh, looking at ACT, the Amazon Conservation Team, a Colombian NGO working with the Inga uh, indigenous people. And they have an established alliance focused on a strategy with a rights-based approach uh, with a shared goal that they have defined together uh, of autonomous indigenous territorial governance. Okay, uh, featuring this instrument called Planes de Vida. 
This is their uh, conceptual framework that they developed, okay, along with indigenous leaders uh, that, that highlights that there are external constraints, but there are also strategic practices and that guided their inquiry. And so this was co-designed with Inga leaders, okay, to go consult with uh, members of the communities as well as the NGO about, well, how do they work and how and what are the constraints and what are the practices? In particular, they have worked with uh, Senora Waida and, and Flora and Lucy, uh, two of those are, are pictured here. They were co-designers of the research, okay, because they had specific answers that they wanted out of this research inquiry. Okay? Another timeline, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skate over this. Uh, this is a complicated slide. The take home lesson is that they did identify and or confirm a variety of external factors, including racism and, and, and neocolonialism, but they also identified some internal factors that challenge uh, effective intercultural collaboration, okay? And they finally identified a, a whole series of strategic practices uh, and I call your attention to the one at the bottom, the acquired of those. Uh, sorry, it's all in Spanish. I'm going back and forth between languages here. But they've been very careful to come to agreements about how they are going to work together. And this has been instrumental in their ability to pursue instrumental strategies based on a shared understanding uh, that everybody has come to agree to in very specific terms. Okay. So to conclude, there are actually, folks, uh, effective strategies for governance of infrastructure, even as most projects go forward. Um, and we've been talking about some of those. This is also available in the GIA uh, final report for the program, uh, the project rather, that's on the GIA website. However, governance of infrastructure is not guaranteed. It's never permanent. It requires strategic planning. The old adage about zombie projects applies here. And I'm on my penultimate slide, Miguel. I know I'm almost done. Um, and there are many learning opportunities that we have discovered across the sites, uh, across the Amazon, the Peruvians learning from the Colombians, Brazilians and Bolivians learning from each other. And, and I just want to point out that a community of practice is a really good platform to engage in not only strategic planning, but also strategic learning. And so this is sort of the, the, the offer uh, from the UF and uh, GIA 1 is over. We're, we're thinking about another GIA project and, and who else we might collaborate with. So there's a lot of, of interest in sharing. Um, so my concluding slide then is a, a shameless pitch for some recent publications that I and a bunch of other people have produced. Uh, and with that, let me stop. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much, Stephen, for that very um, detailed presentation and also, I believe, what is uh, clearly a multi-scale, multi multi-country, uh, involving multiple levels of governance as well. Uh, clearly, uh, a, a focus on indigenous governance systems, which is uh, something that we also uh, were interested in, in highlighting today. So thank you very much for that. Um, I just wanted to remind uh, our audience that you can use the Q&A section on Zoom. If you have questions for the panelists, feel free to just drop off your questions. We will, leave, we will be looking at those and uh, share with, the, uh, with our panelists at the end of today's uh, session. Um, now allow me to introduce um, Jaroslava Avila Montenegro. Jaroslava is a Mapuche indigenous doctoral researcher in the Department of Political Science at York University. And she's also a member of the Toronto-based Women's Coordinating Committee for, the, for, for a Free Walmapu. Her research focuses on state securitization and criminalization of social and indigenous liberation movements in Turtle Island and Abiyayala. Currently, um, Jaroslava is exploring the involvement of hemis hemispheric security organizations under the US-led Operación Condor or Operation Condor. Um, Jaroslava, the room is yours. If you have any um, presentation to share, just, just go ahead and, and share your screen. Thank you, Jaroslava. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mari Mari Pudanien. Uh, my name is Yaroslava Avila Montenegro. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to the panel. I am a little bit underslept and feeling a little bit sick, so I do apologize if I'm a little bit um, 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 absent a little bit, but I'm going to try and do my best to be able to do the presentation. And so uh, today I'm going to be speaking about um, the Mapuche 
um, the Mapuche land uh, claims conflict uh, in the path of the Kimun, Mapuche sovereignty, indigenous uh, territorial reclamation and resurgence. And so just to be able to get um, outline a little bit of what I'll be speaking about, hopefully I won't go too over time. Um, the, um, we're going to go over a bit of the ideological basis of the Mapuche struggle, as well as Mapuche history, um, the territoriality, self-determination, as well as dealing with the uh, occupation, the, the, the dictatorship in Chile, um, and the economics of extraction, um, the resurgence of a people, um, the Mapuche Gum, and other forms of resistance, as well as forms of state securitization and criminalization that continue to this day. So there's quite a lot of things to cover. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Mapuche Nation is a nation in southern Chile, um, or what is currently known as southern Chile. Um, indigenous, um, indigenous societies um, have existed and uh, particularly derived from the concept of sovereignty and being economically, um, environmentally, and culturally viable and inextricably linked to indigenous relationships of the natural world. And so these are the principles to uphold the concept of indigenous sovereignty to be considered a separate legal entity and an analytical concept, but also an expression of identity. And in this way, the belonging of an, of an ancient um, ethnic lineage within a given territory is chosen, not determined by blood quanta, as in the Western construct of race, um, as a political state, as a political statement, a willful inheritance of cultural tradition and hundreds of years of struggle. On the screen, you can see Hector Gaitul, um, who uh, was quoted in saying, our struggle is anti-capitalist by definition. Um, and as Mapuche people, um, our cosmology is based on the teachings of the territory of Guaymapo and what is like what I mentioned today, known as Southern Chile and also Argentina. Um, this is reflected in the Kume Mungin as the yearning for a life of harmony with beings, the creator, the spiritual forces, with nature and with infinite manifestations, with one, um, with infinite manifestations and with oneself. Um, and in this way, the foregoing, the, uh, the foregoing is lived with each territory, a place that encompasses the local, the local whole within one which uh, one which lives where the diversity where, where the diverse relationships are established cohabiting the daily and material reality of the spiritual from this wisdom there is no external related self uh, self subdivided parts but rather dimensions uh, that can uh, constitutively, uh, uh, constitutively exist uh, in a relationship forming a vital and spiritual animated energized whole the Nguyen represents this vital energy, which animates everything and takes care of everything around us. Everything is in con a constant relationship. Everything has a meaning and consequence. Everything is involved. And in this sense, the Kume Mongun offers interesting elements for a comprehensive understanding of our relationship with nature and the material world at hand. It's from this Kume Mongen that the relationship um, with nature or mother nature in Yukimapu is established, which um, is one of interaction and not appropriation. Thus, it is common uh, that when something is going to be removed from it, permission is asked, as is, um, as is also done um, to circulate through certain spaces and places. It is in this way that for the Mapuche, elders are fundamental since they pass on the Kimun, our knowledge, um, receiving from receiving from them from uh, receiving from them the future of their people, the wisdom transmitted daily coexistence um, teaches teaches our people how to relate to the Nyukamapu as a spiritual source of food and health. All that the Nyukamapu use is the is the is the is the Manawen for those who have the Kimun, the Kimun which is the knowledge that we share. The, the struggle for the recognition and autonomy of our people is the revival of the Kimun, of the Kume Mongun and the Kimun, which accounts for, the, our, pe for our people as a nation. And so by contrast, um, this idea of, of the idea of Westphalian sovereignty 
being a system of sovereign states, which recognizes others as the final authorities within their, their given territories, and are and only they can be considered actors within a state system. These tenets based out of the Enlightenment can also be found in the philosophical works of Thomas Hobbes, especially within the, the, the Leviathan. And, if, and further along in the presentation, we'll, we'll begin to see the ideological justification for the confiscation of indigenous lands, the principle of civilization, quote unquote, based on the Enlightenment and that formulates this capitalist economic relation, economic and production relations necessary for the development of the resource based economy, as we shall see uh, in, in the, further on in the presentation. And as we shall see as well, um, it is within this framework that the dialectical contradictions of the Mapuche struggle for liberation is said to be anti-capitalist by definition by the leaders of the, the Mapuche movement. Um, in this case, it is specifically said by Hector Mendú, the leader of the Coordinador Arauco Mañeco, ACAM, well, he's a spokesperson of the organization, um, which is an, a Mapuche group that adopted an anti-capitalist revolutionary perspective to, liber to liberation, highly influenced from a Marxist lens. Here, it's important to point out that this lens is complementary to Mapuche cosmology as an added frame for reference with struggle and isn't meant to supersede it, unlike other takes on indigenous Marxism. And with the realm of indigenous rights, Coulthard outlines two main debates, both in the literature and in practice of indigenous movements, recognition, usually by state actors, and self-determination on the other. So for the purposes of this presentation, I'll be focusing primarily within the realm of self-determination. I will also be focusing primarily on Juan Mabu within what is current day Chile as a focal point of struggle, both historically and in the current day. So I want you all to be able to see the brief overview of Mapuche history. The introduction was rather long and, and dense. And so um, I want you guys to be able to see um, on your screens the, during, the, during the 14th century, Mapuche successfully resisted the invasion of the Inca Empire using their horizontal social structure as an advantage against the conventional Inca fighting methods. Um, they later resisted the Spanish military invasion, culminating in the Kalim Treaty with the Spanish crown in 1641. Um, the first of three treaties which were regulated commercial by bilateral relationships, relationships between the Creoles and the Mapuche by establishing a border on the Bio Bio River, which is, on, which is right in southern Chile. The Mapuche enjoyed this self-determination on their territory for 300 years, continuing well into the Chilean Republic and era which began in 18, uh, 1810. However, this, this jurisdiction of uh, autonomous Mapuche territory would pose an obstacle for the aspirations of the newly formed Republic, since Chile the Chilean state would inherit the hegemonic tendencies of their colonial masters through the construction of its own nation building project. And although the Creoles involved in the independence wars against, against Spain would use anti-colonialist rhetoric to advance their claims, they also supported the notion of centralized, a centralized nation state with the boundaries of demarcated units that of the, central, of the centralized nation state um, that had been initially drawn out by colonizers. This demarcation would be expanded firstly and quietly incorporating autonomous Mapuche territory as part of Chile in the newly established constitution in, in 1819, um, but later then, um, later through the 1881 military occupation of Mapuche territory under the so-called pacification of Araucanía, the occupation of Mapuche territory would, would be um, completed by the Chilean state and is still occupied to this day. And so these processes of displacement left the Mapuche with just 5% of their traditional territory um, in comparison to five, uh, in comparison to the many hundreds of thousands of hectares that they had before stretching all the way into Argentina, south of um, uh, Buenos Aires. And so beyond the military plunder, this is an, also an, an aspect of state hegemony, which is 
reflected in the distinction between this idea of civility and savagery, wherein recognition of, state, of the state of nature enables a process of individual and collective refinement, resulting in what political theorist Bruce Buchan describes as the condition of civilization. By categorizing who and what can constitute as civilized under the enlightenment principles of property, society, and government, the Chilean Republic could portray itself as different from and superior to other peoples, both inside and outside its given borders, thus legitimating the Chilean state's appropriation of the Mapuche lands by implementing a homogenous Western identity and culture within, the, within, within its boundaries. This would also allow for the normalization of European civility and the denial of indigenous so-called savagery, thereby intending the complete destruction and disappearance of indigenous societies. I'm going to move forward quite a bit of time to be able to, I know I have some time left, <laughs> a little bit of time left, um, to be able to speak briefly about Allende and the influence of the Chilean of Chilean socialism's popular unity government on the Mapuche movement. After the, uh, the, 18, the 1883 defeat at the hands of the Chilean state in the war denominated as the pacification of Araucanía, they were uh, indigenous Mapuche people were placed in reducciones, in other words, reservations, much like here, that made up only 6% of their original territory. By 1930, one third of the reduced land claims had been usurped through trickery and other means. Through the century, Mapuche faced several, several severe discrimination and suffered disproportionate levels of poverty. Allende's commitment to social justice then held great appeal for many, and Mapuche gains were substantial, were substantial during his presidency. Um, the Mapuche benefited from the agrarian reforms of previous um, administrations, but especially under Allende's government, in all, uh, 163 properties totaling 152,000 hectares were expropriated in their favor between 1962 and, and 1973. As well, further still, um, this is one of the first times in which the Mapuche people have actually were actually able to unite as a nation and, and develop their own forms of um, their parliaments and be able to decide um, ways in which they can govern themselves as well as also offer policy alternatives for the Allende government in a law that was later made that was later uh, ratified in 1972 recognizing indigenous peoples under the law which had not existed previously and despite what uh, their somewhat different goals Mapuche and left-wing Chileans also were side by side in organizations like the Movimiento Campesino Revolucionario the MR the MCR the peasant arm of the uh, Movimiento Izquierdo Revolucionario Niv, which was a revolutionary Marxist organization at the time. Despite their integrationist nature of the Mir's allyship with Mapuche into Marxist politic and pushing for a broader strategy focused on towards revolutionizing the, the state apparatus, this relationship within with revolutionary politics would greatly influence the Mapuche movement in decades to come, envisioning strategies for their own nation's liberation. So briefly in terms of the economics of plunder, uh, once obviously once Allende falls, um, Pinochet reigns for the next 17 years. This does, this is devast this devastates the Mapuche movement in ways that are completely that, that pushed back the Mapuche at like decades, almost a century. And so there's several things that happened during this period that I'm, I'm gonna try and rush through because I know I'm running out of time. Um, but in terms of the huge did three major things that high, highly affected Mapuche land claims. The first thing was return to the vast majority of land that had been reclaimed to wealthy landowners. This, then the second thing, which is a two-prong approach, was the institutionalization of its policies into the state apparatus itself. The Chicago School of Economics, political theory, as well as the repressive measures into the country's new constitution through neoliberal shock do doctrine. So after the coup, much of the land that had been returned to Mapuche was restored to local farming elites, as I mentioned earlier. Um, by the end of the counter reform, the Pucha families retained only about 16% of the land recovered between 1962 and 73. 
Julio Ponce de Luc, uh, Pinochet's son-in-law, was one of the main architects established, that established, who established the forestry industry in southern Chile, um, who basically allowed for the, the um, who basically allowed for the plantation of monocultures and the processing of cellulose plants, which was monopolized by Chilean transnational corporations um, between two distinct families, the CMPC, the CMPC under the under the, the, the Matis family, which includes Meninco Forestry Incorporate, as well as Bosques Arauco under the Angelinis. And so within this framework, we get um, we we have the the, the, we also have the drafting of several other issues that will affect the Mapuche later in, in that moment and later on, which include the prioritization of water through the drafting of the Chilean constitution in, in 1981, which uh, the prioritization of water, which includes the prioritization of rivers, streams, and lakes, where private corporations own them up until this day, um, as well as setting the stage for the basis of anti-terrorist law Later implement uh, that was later implemented in 1984 as a way to hunt down dissidents. This is also extremely important later, given that the law was not repealed and will be used against Mapuche land defenders in the decades to come. And so, on top of the uh, the, the the estimates of 300 disappeared Mapuche comuneros community members at the hands of the regime. I'm just gonna forward that. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try and make this quick. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so land back through the territorial, the territorial control. In the 90s, as, as so-called democratic transition to hold, so did the increased mobilization of the Puja communities that were kept in, dis in displacement for, for far too long. In reaction to this ongoing displacement, contemporary Mapuche movements had moved towards two distinct but connected anti-capitalist strategies and tactics to be able to reclaim the land. On the one hand, there are the productive takeovers of private land um, estates uh, from forestry plantations over contested territory in an effort to reconstitute traditional forms of sovereignty and identity, rep um, represent, and which represents an alternative to the current political economic system. The purpose of this territorial, these uh, territorial reclamations is to establish the forms of collective property, which had traditionally been developed through organization of family lineages within a given territory. By actively reclaiming the sets of contested territory, the Puchi communities are able to reconstruct traditional forms of indigenous sovereignty through the rein uh, reinforcement of semi-sedentary economic reliance on herding and wild harvesting. These communal self-reliance mechanisms break the dependence of the monetary exchange system and capitalist notions of supply and demand. On the other, there is a majority of land, the majority of land claims are either in the land, the hands of the large landed estate owners or the transnational forestry corporations themselves, which allow for, which where many uh, organizations have sought to um, opted for, have opted for direct action against the forestry industry, continued, it's, it's continued investment in the territory, as well as a variety of different direct action tactics, which include sabotaging logging equipment as a means to dissuade investment uh, in the territory, as well as being able to um, set up um, reclaiming the land for productive takeovers later on. Um, so I'm going to continue on with this. So the state securitization measures really quickly uh, really begin to develop within the context of the trend of the democratic transition. This is where we really see um, the, the nation state building project prompt, prompting this violent response to maintaining its hegemonic power within the context of uh, specifically a neoliberal Chile. And so any, dis, uh, any dissent in terms of being able to reclaim land that is not, that is not recognized by state actors is completely um, criminalized. We have the development, well, we have the implementation of the anti-terrorist law in 2001, where um, Mapuche activists would be charged under the anti-terrorist law for, um, uh, 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 for sabotage, for, for, pro for property sabotage or for issues of property um, <laughs> exceeding, with exceeding sentences. 
And we also have the development of Mapuche political prisoners, many of which who went on hunger strike in the in especially from the 2000s onward. And so and we also have the murder of 17 year old Mapuche activist um, Alex Limun in, in 2002, as well as the, 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 the police murder of 24 year old Matias Cachineo de Sala in 2008, which again is an one of two of at least four uh, criminal deaths at the hands of the Chilean state. And so um, I know that my time is up, and so I'm going to conclude on that. This is essentially the um, the way in which uh, the current um, the current regime is currently operating right now within the context of constant cr criminalization, with Mapuche political prisoners still being held in prison um, because of uh, uh, because of land claims. Um, uh, related issues, and so um, I we would I would love to be able to talk about this a bit more with uh, the with the questions. Um, but I hope that you if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much for having me on the panel, and I'm going to pass it back to Miguel. Thank you, Jaroslava. Thank you really um, for that um, very very um, comprehensive presentation. I, I think, um, so you certainly covered substantive ground, historically and thematically, to understand the Mapuche struggles for self-determination. So that's, um, thank you for that. Um, our third panelist um, is Kimberly Palmer. She's our discussant, which I'm really glad that you accepted our, our, invita our invitation, uh, Kimberly. Kimberly is, uh, she was born and raised in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the West Indies. She recently graduated with a PhD in, the, in environmental studies uh, from York University. And her doctoral research built upon her involvement with the Garifuna grassroots in her home country. Her dissertation was an, a critical ethnography of two contemporary Garifuna organizations struggling against dispossession and displacement in Honduras. Uh, Kimberly received the Michael Baptista Essay Prize in December 2019 from our center, from CERLAC at, at York, uh, for basically her chapter, one of her chapter in her dissertation, Center on Garifuna Land Recuperations in the Bay of Trujillo, Honduras. Kimberly, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to discuss uh, our panelists' presentations. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Oh, I was so scared when you said panelists, Miguel. <laughs> I was like, I don't have anything there, a slideshow or anything like that. But yes, I'm here as a discussant, and I'm just so pleased you invited me. It's been wonderful. I was able to get a glimpse of the presenter's work, um, you know, prior, and I got really, really extra excited. And, you know, our meeting a couple of weeks ago, I was just like really stoked to be around this group of people again because I feel like I don't know I've been at St. Vincent for the past year and a half and really involved in things in Vinci at home so having this chance to sort of step back into work I had been doing and still am sort of like in touch with and involved with and to think think about it again through sort of lenses you know, that are, I guess, invoked a little bit by our presenters today. So it's got me like fired up and my brain firing about how to sort of reapproach my work and integrate it into the session here. So maybe I should talk a little bit about my work. And in particular, I'm gonna focus on the land recuperations because both um, of the presenters work who preceded me um, really had me thinking about strategies and tactics and collaboration as result as um, as connected to indigenous land struggles in and Afro-descendant land struggles in Latin America and the Caribbean. So I did my doctoral research with um, two Garifuna organizations in Honduras. And at first I was like very interested in how these organizations negotiated um, colonial racial formation and, and utilized strategies that sort of drew upon their history of resistance and their refusal to be placed into these sort of colonial racial categories. And this sort of concept which like other folks I have to mention honor and you know people like sort of helped me to 
conceptualize this as um, a space of possibility. So I did look a lot at how, you know, Garifun organizations were able to forge on an international as well as national level solidarities and alliances with um, various groups, whether that be indigenous groups or Afro-descendant groups. But I became particularly intrigued by land recuperation, so tracts of land that follow sort of the the, the, they follow the form of land occupations in Latin America. Um, but there's all of these like subtle differences and nuances that made them very interesting, including that the um, generally the land that the Garifuna are occupying is land that they have received collective title for. Now there was a lot of shortcomings when it came to those titles, of course, and the process was very fraught, um, but the terminology of a recuperation indicates that it's not just sort of like an occupation of large, you know, like land grab by um, a private entity, for example, um, but rather a statement of like this land has been, you know, taken from, from us. Um, and they do have, you know, legal documents stating that. So there's these various strategies that need to be enlisted because there are a host of other, um, happenings in Honduras that make it very, very difficult for Garifunas to claim their place on the land, even with their collective titles. So there has to be these additional tactics and strategies that do call upon sort of like, you know, transnational actors and organizations, collaborations with NGOs and so on and so forth to really sort of like get the message out there, get some of the attention on the group and, and so on and so forth. But on the micro level, level at the recuperations, I was also fascinated by the way that the community members involved in land defense committees, which are sort of at the very like grassroots level, like in the communities, who are supported in various forms by these organizations on a national and international level, but have a great degree of autonomy. And how in those spaces in the community itself, when the land defense committees are organizing to occupy or recuperate attractive land, these land back movements involve staying on the land and often enacting sort of a usage of the land that's in line with sort of, I guess, Lockean logics that underpin Eurocentric notions of like what appropriate land use is and which do underpin a lot of land occupations in Latin America in terms of like performing, you know, like land for those that work it, right? So, Garifuna land recuperations do sort of follow along these logics um, and represent themselves as, you know, there's farming and there's often like clearing of the land and so on in order to um, represent the recuperation along these sort of hegemonic lines of understanding what land ownership should look like. And in this process, there has been um, a lot of alliance building between you know, various people in the communities. Now, Garifunas in Honduras are an Afro-Indigenous people. So like, as I said, you know, they don't, um, they've resisted you know, being Indigenous or Afro-descended solely. And as an Afro-Indigenous group, they um, have faced you know, big land grabs by like Canadian investors, like state players, so on and so forth. But there's also a big narrative around the smaller, like micro, like kind of scale land grabs that occur and like really, you know, rest upon racial logics. So, and often, you know, it's the movement of Ladino or Mestizo or in Honduras, people say Indio, um, like landless peasants onto Garifuna land um, and then this land often becomes incorporated into like larger grabs. At some point it becomes sold and it becomes privatized through this sort of method. Um, and there's increasing, so you'd often hear when I was on the ground in the Bay of Trujillo, you would often hear, um, you know, Garif Garifunas say, no, Kim, you know, like the real problem is like, you know, this is like these smaller like invasions and so on and so forth. So when I was, very happy enough to go to a recuperation called Wanile, because there's many in the Bay of Trujillo and many across Honduras and Garifuna territory. 
um, I was sort of struck by the fact that a large percentage of the recuperation members, so land defense committee members who had, you know, gone onto the land at that point, you know, setting up camp, you know, clearing the land, starting farming processes, being supported by larger garrison organizations, you know, um, but there were a lot of Ladino um, peasant members. And it was very interesting, you know, um, various discussion points, you know, it's this sort of like um, an, an invasion, like in the middle of a recuperation, like what is like, you know, peasant occupation sort of like look like if it's like occupying Garifuna land, which has been historically the problem, but now, you know, people are involved in our, um, our recuperations, but we're a bit like worried about what that could look like. So I was very interested in the way that people spoke amongst themselves on the, at the recuperation, the way that every day, what, what that looked like in the everyday reality for people to negotiate like their belonging and their solidarity and for indigenous, Afro-Indigenous people in this case to lead that process, right? So that the understanding of the land that everybody was coming to was one that was in line with Garifuna cosmology. And um, I just thought it was, it was, it was um, a very like hopeful and like wonderful place to be. In the recuperation i mean i don't want to downplay the terrible 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 violence and and the awful things that um are happening in honduras like in nicaragua like 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 people like folks have mentioned i don't want to downplay that at all um but i do i do want to say that the you know the building of different worlds in these in these spaces and um just to talk a bit i guess to stephen too um, and sort of maybe looping everybody else. I feel like I just really went down my own little rabbit hole there and got very self-centered and I apologize. But yeah, so I'm interested in these sorts of collaborative processes at sort of all sorts of scalar levels, multi-scalar levels and on the micro and the macro. And to um, Yaroslava as well, I, I was, you know, when I, when I, I had looked at your presentation, I had read it and looking at these, um, um, the productive takeovers, you know, and the, the land reclamation movement there um, in Chile. So it sort of stimulated some of, you know, like thinking, wow, this is a pretty interesting um, way for me to think about it. Um, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add in or if you know anything a bit about the Garifuna struggle or if there's anything else I could elaborate upon. Of course, I was muted. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kimberly, for that um, interesting uh, commentary to both your work, sharing your work, and also to our, our panelists. I think uh, I, I agree with you. The question of collaboration uh, run across all presentations to, tonight. I think it's really clear that um, both uh, Stephen and Jaroslava sp spoke about collaborative at, at different levels, right? Um, so that would be maybe something you can uh, both, Stephen and, and Jaroslava, maybe expand a little bit in the context of your, of your, of your research and also your experience. Is that, and I'm gonna open the floor also as well for questions and, and answers from uh, our, our, our audience. Thank you. Um, yeah, before I do so, Stephen, do you mind? I'm just gonna read a question that has just been posed in the Q&A section. Um, uh, it, this is from Christopher Jones. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, Dr. Peirce, great presentation. Just wondering, looking at the state uh, influence, violence resulting from dam building and other infrastructural development in the Amazon, how might indigenous and Afro people outside this jurisdiction mobilize to provide support? I guess this speaks clearly to also Jaroslava's uh, uh, discussion. Thank you. Well, th th there's a couple of ways to approach this, whether we bring up collaboration and, and you bring in outside organizations who can, as, as I mentioned in one of the cases, pursue a communication strategy. So these things do not go unreported, uncontested. Uh, this is often a very important role for outside organizations. Uh, is, is getting the word out as to what's going on, uh, whether there's outright violence, uh, uh, physical violence, or if there's other forms of violence. I mean, there's also the term slow violence and, and various forms of political violence that, that can occur as well. Um, but, but yes, I think this is where communication strategies and collaborative alliances become very important in thinking about 
what are the media, what are the, the outlets, who is the audience. Uh, I will comment that in, in some of the uh, communities of practice, they've been operating largely online, or, or at least in part online, uh, especially during COVID through social media, right? And so this is an obvious way that uh, even if you have somewhat limited bandwidth, you can get images, you can even get video at certain times um, uh, and, and get stuff out uh, to others who can transmit uh, what's going on elsewhere. Um, th this is also relevant to the legal strategies uh, and, and in the longer consultative process, uh, at least in the case of infrastructure, uh, in terms of making sure everybody knows if there's gonna be an audiencia pública uh, and, and so people actually go. Uh, and, and use that opportunity then as, as a platform to fully participate instead of just passively listen, uh, but also to document what goes on at these kinds of things um, that they not turn into another step in the rubber stamp process if, if the discussion is the EIA or the land demarcation or a review of a cadaster uh, as to where things stand and the information that's brought to bear. Uh, we, we've also seen cases, another element of GIA that was really a big deal in Loreto uh, had to do with mapping uh, and participatory mapping and counter mapping and contestation through maps uh, as to where the boundaries of, of certain uh, areas are uh, and whether the government had legal basis to cross. Uh, and, and we get into areas, issues like that. I'm getting a little bit beyond the violence issue, but it's still germane to, to that issue um, in terms of getting information out in a timely fashion uh, that that official statements could be contested then, uh, and this kind of thing. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jaroslava. I'm just going to read a question that I know you wanted to speak on the question of collaboration. So allow me to just add to that. Maybe you can uh, take on both questions next. But this is there's a question from Claudio Egdal. I think it's uh, it's quite relevant to ongoing debates in Chile about the. Um, the constitutional reform, the new constitution. Um, how do Mapuche groups who positions are seen as more radical, such so and in parentheses, a break from the state, pro full autonomy as independent Mapuche nation, may see the efforts of born from Chile's popular uprising in 2019 and 20 negotiated institutionalized or constitutional convention which intends to guarantee rights for ind indigenous population in Chile within a multicultural and multi-ethnic social arrangement. So how do you see this and the, the new progressive governments headed by uh, the new president, Gabriel Boric? That's uh, it's a long question. I, did it, uh, I don't know if I read it correctly, but that's, I, I guess you get it, right? Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you, Thank yeah, you. no worries. Um, okay, I'll start. In order, <laughs> so that way we can, like, and I will get to Claudio's question last. Um, so in terms of collaboration, um, this idea of collaboration, I think, is, like, within within the Mapuche territory itself, um, there's always been this really interesting dynamic. And I, I, I touched on, on it a little bit in the presentation about um, how poor um, working class, um, how poor peasants, for example, ally themselves, uh, can ally themselves with the Mapuche and the Mapuche have always sought to um, to, to ally themselves with them um, and be able to uh, strategize as to the bigger picture. Because the, the especially in uh, Abayala in Latin America, the class divides and the class consciousness is really stark and really clear. Um, it's not. It's. It, I find, for example, that sometimes um, these dynamics are a bit more unclear here, and mostly because of the hegemony that exists here, because we are in the imperial core. Um, with that said, um, in Mapuche territory, it's very common to be able to have those alliances between um, Chilean those who identify as a Chilean and who are uh, poor peasants or poor working class people um, together with um, the Mapuche people and their plight for sovereignty as a means for mutual liberation, as a kind of mutual aid even. Um, it was more of a question, it was definitely seen throughout the 70s when we see the, the rise of Allende and with uh, the left in Chile, 
um, as per the example in the presentation with the mirror. Um, but we also see it later too, and even now with Lacan, with because they articulate this idea of necessitating this idea of collaboration um, with different working class um, people throughout Chile, right? Whether or not they identify as being indigenous or not, in part also because there is that question of, well, um, the, this idea of, 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 of identity in terms of indigeneity is also something that is can be reclaimed because of the different kind of colonization that happened in Abayala, especially in the Southern Cone, versus what happens here in, in Turtle Island, which is much more of a, um, an apartheid approach versus there was a very, very much a melting pot um, approach. And so um, in terms of um, in terms of colonization. With that said, uh, even, and so this kind of leads into Claudio's question in terms of um, with, uh, with Gabriel Boric and the, um, the uprising that happened, that's happening now sorry. in, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go no, ahead. no, 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 certainly, yeah, no, go ahead. Um, it's uh, in that um, there, there is, there is a, there is a, there's, I, I don't want to say it's necessarily a split exactly, but there is a difference in terms of different um, Mapuche groups, um, mostly between rural Mapuche groups versus urban Mapuche groups that seek different kinds um, of, different forms of their, of liberation. Um, within the urban setting, it's much more, um, we can see that the, um, the, the collaboration that takes place is much more within the framework of recognition within the state apparatus, rather than necessarily just having this idea of autonomy or the idea of autonomy being attached to the state, whereas in the countryside, that is a bit more stark in terms of the actual, um, uh, the, the need for autonomy in the territories. Um, and so in regards to Claudio's question, whether or not um, this new progressive government in, uh, will address the issues of the, um, the, the more radical <laughs> Mapuche movement. Um, I think we've seen that actually in the last week where we've, um, well, Gabriel Boric is, is open to negotiations and they're open to negotiations to some degree. I believe I heard, I believe a couple of days ago that the GAM is still very much in the position of like, well, this is a settler colonial state. We are still dealing with our land claims. We're still fighting. So we, if we're going to negotiate, we want our free the Mapuche political prisoners um, and a couple of other demands that were set brought forward by the communities in, um, in resistance to the government. I'm not exactly sure if there was a response. I don't, I think there might've been. <laughs> so that's something I need to catch up on, but I think we'll see. I think it depends on whether or not the government will be actually open to negotiating with the communities that have been, you know, resisting for the last 20, 30 years. And, um, and, and whether or not those communities will be comfortable with the plurinational estate that is currently being developed uh, with the new constitution that's being drafted um, um, because of the social revolt in 2019. I think that those things can, there, there might be, I personally think there might be a split maybe later on. I will, will, will have to wait and see. <laughs> that's, that, that's, my, that's my response <laughs> to that question. Thank you very much, Jaroslava. Um, you're getting many questions here. Um, I'm just going to go over them and, um, and you can maybe think what you can respond in the time that we have left. And maybe we can follow up later with um, people who have actually posed the questions. There is a, there is a question uh, from Christopher, from Christopher Jones. Uh, Jaroslava, what do you think would be some of the responsibilities of the ac academy in advocacy? Uh, that's, um, that's a question that comes from Christopher. Then Bradley Evoy is asking you, what do you feel are the practical lessons to be learned from the Mapuche struggle for self-determination that you discuss for the colonized people's movements in, on Turtle Island, right? in particular indigenous movements? These are really interesting questions. Um, Professor Lisa Nord is also uh, 
she made a commenter, which is really important. I think she asked me to pass it to you. Um, uh, just one second here. Um, I have to look it up. I think I miss it. Uh, she mentioned that there is a documentation on the Mapuche struggles uh, that are uh, preserved in the Latin American and Caribbean Studies uh, Documentary Center that you may want to look at. I will retrieve the original message. And then a question from Professor Honor Ford Smith, who's also part of our Baptista Committee. Uh, she's interested in, uh, in, in um, in your view or your discussion on how Mapuche groups contest Western ideas of race and how this plays out of uh, into notions of resistance. I know this is a big, these are all very, very big questions, uh, Yaroslava, and um, feel free to maybe focus on, on the questions that you can ask or respond in the time we have left. Um, and uh, and then I think, yeah, we're going to have another round and then I think we will be aiming at closing today's uh, webinar. Um, OK, I'll try and respond to them real quick because I tend to ramble. Um, <laughs> so with um, the idea of advocacy in, ac in academia, I think that um, we as scholars need to be accountable to the indigenous people, like the indigenous groups that we work with directly or indirectly. We have to be able, there are different guidelines actually um, that, are, that are actually quite useful um, within the realm of uh, the working with groups in Turtle Island that I would highly recommend um, uh, looking at. I believe the Anishinaabe has one about how to deal with research specifically. I think that those principles can be used um, within the context of research. It's also that we also have to be reflexive um, and be able to um, uh, understand the like, positionality and the and where we're coming from too. Um, I think it's really important to not necessarily hide like. Um, I'm coming from a Mapuche, from a, from like my background is 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 from Chile. It's Mapuche, um, and so I can speak my lived experience through the the the, the research that I do. Um, but for those for those who don't, um, it's still really important to be able to have that reflexivity and and be able to um, understand ideologically too where you stand, so that you know who to ally with too as well. Right? That's something that I think that people don't talk about often enough. Um, so that's a response to, to Christopher's question um, in regards to Brad Bradley's question. Um, I think that maybe one of the things that we don't often talk about, uh, and this goes into the other questions as well, is this idea of, of autonomy and um, the, the, the productive reclamations in that think about this idea of reclaiming the land beyond capitalism, because um, there is a question here about indigenous sovereignty that often gets talked about, and it's I know it's debated in, in indigenous circles here, um, which is the question of um, the incorporation of, in, of like capitalism within the project of indigenous sovereignty, and now. I think that self like uh, self determination comes first and foremost. We need to su support our peoples here as well as support our peoples, you know, in Abayala. That's not a question, but I think it would be helpful to be able to look at things within that perspective and again understand ideology because I think the 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 question isn't that we integrate ideology uh, within the framework of indigenous sovereignty per se, but rather use it as a frame and as a tool to be able to understand our current world and, you know, apply, use it as a, as a tool in a many, in the toolbox um, of, of, of things that we can, we can do for whatever the liberation looks like and be honest with ourselves about what that is. Um, so that would be something that I think would be really helpful. Uh, in terms of um, how much Pucha groups deal with Western ideas of race, um, the idea of race is also constructed differently in Abayala, especially in the Southern Cone, than in other, I would even argue in other parts of Abayala itself, as well as Turtle Island. It's not a quick, it's not a one, one stop solution to, to be able to deal with. In terms of this idea of blood quantum, I will say, is not a, necessarily a thing the 
the way in which uh, colonization happened in Chile, especially was the targeting of Okucha people because of their last name. Uh, and because Spanish people have this whole thing about last names. And so, um, and so people change their name to be able to fit in society. Those who man manage to maintain their last name are seen as more um, connected to the community. Even then, I have seen Mapuche groups um, not necessarily take that into too much consideration because of the way in which colonization happened, where all of us have some kind of mixed blood within within us. And the idea is trying to be able to understand and take it, take this ideologically as well in terms of I, 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 accepting the identity of being indigenous, which is highly discriminated in Latin, Latin America, even more so, I would even argue, than in other parts of the world, where it's you have to have guts to be able to identify as indigenous if you don't want to be harassed on the street. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's, it's an ownership of that identity, as well as the conviction of that particular struggle, too, and how the community also integrates you into that um, into that struggle as well because that is also a, an important process that that community itself recognize you as being part of that community which is again very different than the way things are here that's because of a very different form of colonization that happened here in terms of um, a, a, the use of apartheid um, on these lands and it's and completely understandable that indigenous people here will view it completely differently. Thank you very much uh, for your generosity in responding to all three questions. Um, thank you. Uh, the comment by Professor Nord is that um, she wanted to share this with you, that George Manuel, head of the BC Union of Chiefs, was part of a fact-finding mission among the Mapuche sponsored by the Interchurch Committee on Human Rights in Latin America in 1979. Uh, I think she's asking you to maybe look, uh, look, at, look at that as a source of, 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 of documentary as well. Um, if you don't mind, I, I'm just going to maybe just try to wrap it up one more round of, of your responses. There is one, one more questions, uh, one more question for uh, Stephen, also from Christopher Jones. Um, Stephen, do, do political ecological theories sufficiently capture the legacies of colonialism as it relates to land displacement in the Amazon? Um, that's a, it's a question for you. Why don't you, if you're if you're okay with you with all uh, both panelists and 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 and, and Kim, maybe take uh, the next five minutes to maybe uh, not five but maybe we can do ten minutes and your concluding remarks um, to tonight's uh, panel. Uh, well, the, the, Chris's question is a great question. I mean, political ecology by now means uh, it's another one of these terms. It means lots of things to lots of people, and it has different approaches. Um, I guess if, if I were to give a really short, blunt answer, I would say no, uh, because I, I think political ecology, most variants really take a structural approach, a multi-scalar approach, and they're, they're worried about the now. And, you know, in displacement due to infrastructure, you know, who are the players now? What are the political relationships now? And, and I do think that there are really big opportunities to bring in uh, neocolonial studies, post-colonial studies, th thought that, that has really blossomed in the last 10, 20 years about what decolonization means as it can, in, as it encounters political ecology. Um, because I think post-colonial thought, decolonization, they, they do force us to examine much deeper histories and the many different meanings of what colonization, colonialism, neocolonialism, decolonization, what, what all of these things really mean discursively, materially, structurally, uh, ontologically, uh, and, and so forth. And so I, I think there are opportunities. Uh, I, I can't map them out instantly here, but, but, but I think there are definitely opportunities to, for, for political ecology to engage uh, these other more historically grounded, historically deep uh, uh, traditions of thought, and, and as they're as they're emerging now, um, 
So yeah, you have my wheels spinning about this. You know, what, what does a no mean? It means a lot of things that, that I think still deserve to be explored. Thank you, thank you. Kimberly? Yes, well, thank you very much again to Yaroslava and to Stephen. I learned so much from your work and really enjoyed um, thinking through my own work and my own experiences through some ideas that your work stimulated within me. Um, I guess I was also thinking just something else, just looking at meaning and um, meaning making processes or just different ways to view um, something. I, um, I know earlier when I had been speaking a bit about land recuperation, the particular methods of sort of land use being performed there, that at the same time as um, it sort of is in line with some dominant notions of land use that are also um, racialized. Um, at the same time, the Garifuna land defenders so skillfully engage these practices and these performances, not only to feed themselves and sustain the recuperation, but of course, the, the various plants, the various methods that people are using are, you know, Garifuna methods, um, Garifuna crops, staples, and there's quite a number of um, um, forcibly returned young Garifuna men, like deportees basically from the um, United States at the land recuperations. And um, one of these much larger land recuperations that's gained a lot of um, attention is Vallecito. Um, this is one very big one, kind of very um, close to Ofrene, which is one of the big organizations there, the Garifuna organizations. But in the smaller ones, like Wanile, you'll also see that, you know, deportees, they come back from like New York City. They've been up there since they were really small in many cases and they come back and they have like nothing. The land crisis means that they, you know, the, inter the intergeneration, like there's like six generations of people living in a home, you know, like on Garifuna land. So they, they, they need the land, they need something to do there. They, they, they can't go back to, they, they try often to go back to the States over land. Um, but uh, often get, you know, apprehended and, and further criminalized and incarcerated and, you know, deported again in a cycle. And at some point often say, hey, I resign myself to staying here, you know, and really, you know, lean into the land defense movement out of like a lot of necessity. But also it becomes like a learning center. You know, it's like the Vallecito is kind of becoming like a Garifuna University, like as we speak. And then in all of the smaller ones in the Bay of Trujillo, like Juanile, you know, um, yeah, I mean, people are coming and they're learning how to, you know, use a machete and clear the land and to grow traditional foods and crops and so on. So it, it, it serves this sort of dual purpose. And again, it can't really be put into one or the other sort of space of possibility between like the representations of land use and, and, and what people are, are doing with these sort of like actions and performances. That they Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, Jaroslava? Any, you know, you've received a lot of questions and there, there are other questions as well, but I guess just for the, the respect of everyone in the, in the panel, we will be closing in the next two minutes or so. But if you have anything else, Yaroslava. Um, I, uh, well, first of all, again, uh, thank you again for the, for the invitation. Um, I also, I think one of the things that we should be able to talk about, at least in terms of um, a of political prisoners in terms of being able to um, uh, hopefully, I, I, I really hope that things will turn around uh, in the near future for, uh, for my people in that way and, and hope that the current government is able to listen and if not then you know it's going to be it's going things are going to get difficult quickly and I just I hope that things can get resolved so that way um, uh, people on the ground can also get a break from the last many years of intensity <laughs> that has brought everything up until this point. And I'm sure that that's not just unique to the Makucha people in, in Chile, but also to the rest of uh, Chilean, uh, Chilean society. So that's basically my final, those are my final. Thank you. Thank you again. And thanks everyone really. And uh, to you as, as panelists and, and Kim as discussant, um, for your amazing questions and your uh, superb presentations. We have recorded this event and it will, the recording will be posted on, on CERLAC's website. Um, 
finally, I just wanted to pass it on to Professor Honor Ford Smith, um, who is a member of our executive committee at CERLAC and uh, also a, a, a key person behind the conception of the Baptista Lecture Series in, in th this year. And uh, by the way, this is our last uh, panel of the series. And I believe it uh, has, has been an amazing, an amazing event. So thank you very much. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it on to, to Honor, who's going to offer just uh, some concluding words. Uh, you're muted. Honor. <laughs> thanks, Miguel. And thanks to everybody. In a sense, I think we have ended where we should have begun. Uh, and I like to think of this panel as pointing the way forward for um, further discussions about indigeneity, race, and land in, um, in the region, in the hemisphere, and in the world. I think it's wonderful to um, to end this way and also to be able to hear how people from different parts of this very large region are all helping us to rethink the role of the state, the kind of state that we might want to have or not have in a decolonial context. They're raising important questions about the limitations of the kinds of nation states that we have inherited and the possibilities going forward um, for autonomy and new ways of conceptualizing governance. So that was one thing that I thought was um, emerged from all of the discussions and the panelists tonight. The other thing um, that I think emerged uh, very clearly is what decolonization means and decolonization means one thing for the people who are colonized but it also is an important process for the colonizer and i think the questions posed here tonight uh turn the light back on us as uh people who have in a way benefited from um, settler colonialism and nothing makes this more vivid than the question of Lottie Cunningham and what is happening in Nicaragua um, and what is happening throughout the whole region, throughout the whole uh, region of South and Central America and the Caribbean in terms of the expansion of mining generally, uh, but also the expansion of mining, which is driven by Canadian interests. And I think that that is a good place for us to end because as we think about how we might defend Lottie and how we might support um, the struggles that are going on regionally, we need to also think about how the role of the state where we are located is implicated in what is happening throughout the region. So those are things that we can take forward and thank you so much. And I just want to encourage those of us who stayed till the very end to remember to send in um, solidarity messages to Lottie, but also to write to the first secretary of the Nicaraguan National Assembly, asking them to reverse their treatment of NGOs in Nicaragua. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honor. And again, thank you for your commitment and support, uh, inspiration to the Baptista uh, panel series. Uh, thank you again, Stephen, Kimberly, Jaroslava, for your uh, time and your commitment to this panel. And sending big uh, greetings also to Lottie Cunningham. I'm pretty sure she will be interested in, in, in our discussion today and the letters of support that we will certainly send. Thank you very much again to everyone and have a wonderful, a wonderful evening. Thanks. <laughs>